In this video, we're going to look at some questions based on particle physics, which means we're going to look at like radioactivity and radiation mostly. Okay, so we've got a decay curve for a beta emitting isotope. Uh, so use the diagram to find the half-life of the isotope. So half-life is the time for the activity to halve, or the time for the number of undecayed nuclei to halve. Uh, so we can read that off the graph by drawing a line at 50%, and we can see that the half-life is four days. So now we want us to complete the diagram uh, as far as the time equals 20 days by working out the values of the number of points. Um, so we know it would be at 25% after 8 days and then 12.5% after 12. So that gives us uh, two more points to plot. And then we can draw a line making sure we go past 20 days as it says. Okay. So the decay product is not radioactive. Explain why the sample of radioactive isotope will be safer after 20 days than after one day. Support your answer by referring to the graph. So at 20 days, the activity is around about 2, 3%, something like that. Whereas after one day, it's 85. So the activity at 20 days is considerably lower, which means it's going to be safer because there are fewer decays every second. And the fewer decays, the lower the risk is going to be. So the isotope is used, maybe represented by the AZX notation. Write down an equation by filling in the gaps to show the beta minus decay. So, uh, first of all, a beta particle is just an electron, which we represent like this. And then to make sure the numbers balance, we can see we've still got um, A for this the nucleon number hasn't changed, whereas to make the charge balance, we clearly need one more proton. Uh, so we've got Z plus one, and that should fit with what you know. So you should know beta minus a neutron turns into a proton and an electron. So a radioactive isotope emits only alpha particles. In the space below, draw a label diagram of the apparatus you would use to prove that no beta particles or gamma radiation are emitted. Okay, so what we'd need is a is essentially all of this equipment. So we've got our source, and we've got a piece of paper, and we've got a way of measuring it. So we've got a Geiger-Muller tube. So what we would do is the first thing we'd do is we'd take a measurement with no source or barrier to get the background count rate. So we just stick the Geiger-Muller tube in the room find out what the background count rate is. Then take a reading with no barrier to measure the source count rate, and then finally take a reading with the paper barrier. Those are the three measurements we'd need to take. We would repeat each of those measurements naturally. So explain how your results would show that only alpha particles are emitted. Well, the count rate would drop to background when the paper barrier is inserted because paper can absorb alpha radiation and it won't pass through. Uh, so that would is why it would happen. Okay, so the diagram shows a steady stream of alpha particles about to enter the space between the poles of a very strong magnet. Describe the path of the alpha particles in the space. Uh, so we've got the charged positive particles going from left to right, so your middle finger points that way. Uh, the field just goes from north to south, so you point your first finger downwards, and you can see your thumb points into the page, so it's going to experience a force perpendicular to the velocity and the magnetic field, and it would be bent downwards into the page. So sodium nucleus decays by the emission of a beta minus particle to form magnesium. Complete the equation. Uh, well, this is magnesium. Beta minus increases the proton number by one, uh, doesn't change the nuclear number. And then we have the beta particle as well. So we've got beta particles going through the same field. Uh, so they would experience a force. Again, it's going to be perpendicular to the velocity magnetic field, but it's going to bend upwards out of the page instead of into the page. So very small quantities of a radioactive isotope are used to check the circulation of blood by injecting an isotope into the bloodstream. Describe how the results are obtained. So a detector is held near to the part of the body, interest, and you measure the count rate. Because uh, what should happen is if lots of blood is going through that point, you should get a high count rate because that means lots of isotope is going through that point as well. So that tells you you've got good circulation, or if it's a low count rate, it tells you the circulation at that point is quite low. 
explain why a gamma emitting isotope is used for this purpose rather than alpha or beta well it's about its penetration so alpha and beta could, could be absorbed by tissue and by skin and it's not going to reach the detector and that's going to make the reading smaller than it should have been Okay, so the decay of a nucleus of radium leads to the emission of an alpha particle and leaves behind radon. Write an equation for this. Uh, so an alpha particle is two neutrons, two protons, so four nucleons. So you've got, and we refer, you can have an alpha there, but I usually refer to it as a helium nucleus. Okay, so in an experiment to find the range of alpha particles, we've got this set of equipment. So we basically got a source and a detector and a ruler to measure the distance between them. Okay, so state what causes the count rate nine centimeters from the source. Well, we can see at seven, eight, and nine, the count rate stays pretty much the same, certainly within experimental uncertainty anyway. So we can see that that's gonna be background radiation. Estimate the count rate due to the source at two centimeters. Well, we need to subtract background from the value to give us the counts from the source. Suggest a value for the maximum distance that alpha particles can travel from the source. Um, so I reckon anything over five is, would be it. And the reason being the count rate drops from being quite high, 317, to suddenly just being background. So it's got to be somewhere between five and six centimeters, the range. So a radioactive source emits only beta particles. A scientist wishes to investigate the deflection of beta particles by an electric field. Draw a diagram uh, to suggest a suitable arrangement. Uh, so here's our setup. We've got a positive plate and a negative plate. Uh, we, we need some sort of power source to create that, which I probably should have shown in there. We've got our source and then we've got our Geiger-Muller tube on the opposite side of the electric field. So in order to show the deflections, we're going to need to measure the account rate at different locations. So we take a reading near the positive plate in the middle and near to the negative, And those measurements, you should see that count rate is higher at one of them indicating deflection. So how would, what results would we get? Well, we should get a high count rate um, near the positive plate because well, they're negatively charged beta particles, so they should deflect to the positive plate. So we, we should get that. So explain the direction of the detection. So what is the key is the fact that the beta particles are negatively charged, so they're attracted to the positive plate through the electric force. Okay, so the diagram shows the path of three alpha particles moving towards a thin gold foil. Uh, so it wants us to complete the path. So they're all going to go up to the gold foil, so we can put that in straight away. It says A moves directly towards a gold nucleus, so it's going to be deflected by a large angle. It's had a head-on collision. B moves along a line that's close to a nucleus, so it's going to be deflected by nowhere near as much. C moves along a line which does not pass anywhere near a nucleus, where it's just going to continue basically undeflected. State how the results using a large number of alpha particles provide evidence for the existence of nuclei. So the key is that most particles are undeflected. That shows that most of the atom is empty space. Only a couple are deflected through large angles, which must mean that they encountered the small positive nucleus. So uh, it shows it's not completely empty space, that there is something in there that can affect things. So chlorine has two isotopes, uh, nucleons 35 and 37, proton number is 17. Fill in the table. So there's that means proton number of chlorine is 17, so in both cases uh, the proton number is 17. Isotopes have the same proton number, but they have different neutron numbers, and we do 35 minus 17 to get 18, and 37 minus 17 to give us 20. Electrons is always going to balance out the number of protons, so that's going to be 17 as well. Some isotopes are radioactive, state three types of radiation can be emitted, or well, that's our alpha, beta, and gamma. We don't need to say beta minus or beta plus, beta is fine at this level. Let's take one practical use of a radioactive isotope. While well, the two that leap to mind to me, uh, we use beta or gamma for thickness measurement in different circumstances, and we use gamma for medical imaging and treatment as well. 
to outline how it's used. So I'm going to talk about the thickness measurement. So uh, paper thickness can be measured using a beta source. So you, what you do is you put a source on one side of paper, a detector on the other, and if the paper gets too thick, then the count rate decreases and then the machine adjusts to th thin the paper out. So it's an automatic detection device. So the diagram shows an experiment to test the absorption of beta particles by thin sheets of aluminium. Ten sheets available, each 0.5 millimeters thick. Describe how you'd carry the experiment out, stating the readings that should be taken. Well, the first reading that needs to be taken is measuring background. So you take a measurement without any aluminium at all and without the source as well, actually. And then you'd measure the cat rate with aluminium and subtract the background count rate. Okay, because that tells you how many, the count rate from the source. Take the results you'd expect to retain. Well, as the thickness of aluminium increases, the count rate should decrease. As the thicker it is, the more it's going to absorb the radiation. And after about 10 sheets, we'd expect the count rate to drop to zero once we have accounted for the background count rate, because uh, that's about the limit to which beta radiation can travel in aluminium, about uh, five centimeters max. So a beam of ionizing radiation containing alpha particles, beta particles and gamma rays is traveling left to right across the page. The magnetic field acts perpendicular into the page. Okay. In the table below, tick the boxes that describe the defection of each of the types of radiation as it passes through. So it says uh, an alpha particle is going to deflect towards the top of the page. So let's check that. Uh, so our magnetic field is going into the page. They're going left to right. So our middle finger, our middle finger point is left to right. Our first finger points into the page. So you can see how indeed our thumb tells us alpha particle goes towards the top. And we're going to get a small deflection because now alpha particle has quite a lot of mass. Beta particles are going to go the opposite direction because they have opposite charge. And they're going to get a large deflection because their mass is very small. And then finally, gamma rays are not going to be affected because they're neutral, so they're not affected by magnetic fields. An electric field is now applied in the same region as the magnetic field and at the same time as the magnetic field. What is the direction of the electric field in order to cancel out the deflection of the alpha particles? Well, it's got to be perpendicular to the magnetic field, and actually the positive needs to be at the top of the page, uh, so then that reverses the effect of the magnetic field.